Hi guys, I just want to go over um, some pointers for bidding the Lee Enfield number 4 Mark 1 um, SMLE. This action is a bit different to what you'd normally encounter because of the way it's assembled. Um, when you're doing your bedding on these, the wood doesn't come up and down like it normally would, so that makes it very, very difficult for bedding. Instead, it comes out of this out this way. So we have to do some special little tricks just to make sure that we um, don't lock the job in place. Now as you can see this one's a fully wooded example so we want to do a really nice job of it. It's actually got a, a brand new barrel. Um, the whole thing's not been used before so she's a lovely example and we really need to look after it. Um, of course a collector would rather leave it unbedded but we're going to bed it because this one is actually going to be put to use in a, in a very light way. So, um, if you have a close look at what I've done through this area here, we're going to start from the front and go to the back. The fully wooded Lee Enfield has a barrel band. Now, when we bed it, we're not going to put that barrel band in there. What I've uh, found is that a cable tie is the same diameter as the barrel band. It's just a, it's just a little bit fatter, a little bit wider this way. So a cable tie is ideal. So I've zipped up the cable tie and... Um, locked it there and then just cut off the tip of the cable tie and then I've put a layer of insulation tape around that just to stop any leaching of compound although it wouldn't be too bad if it did leach through that area there <coughs> now we go back to this boss here this is quite a, a pro problematic area because if you don't put this plaster scene around the back it's lock it just locks completely in place and you'll find that you'll smash your bedding as you try and bring it out and that's why you don't tend to see too many um, good Lee Enfield bedding jobs because people are just too timid about bedding around this area so instead what we do is we can put this plaster scene in the back here and when we break the job out that plaster scene will just disintegrate as we pull it out so that's fine and as per usual the front of the boss is taped off like we'd normally do with a recoil lug and you can see that I've got just a little wee tip of the rear of the boss which is going to act as a lug surface. It's just a very, very minute surface area but it will be enough because we're going to have some other bits and pieces to work with. Okay, so as usual the front faces, our front squares in here are tape relieved. So you can see the tape on both sides there. So that means that under recoil it can return to battery which is very important. Now for a lug rebate, we're going to use this piece just here as a recoil lug. So we've got just a little piece here, see that pencil line there? It's showing us where the bedding's going to come up to, so from there down we're going to use it as a recoil lug. Now on this side, we're going to use just a sliver of this material, but behind here, um, there's a potential for the job to become trapped again. So I've put some plasticine in there so that we can break that out. So all we've got for a recoil lug really on that side is just this little piece here. And as you can see I've put plasticine through these areas here. Now you'll hear some guys talk about bedding the rear face of the Lee Enfield which is traditionally quite important as, as having a good contact area there. That's normally where it recoils against. We're going to be using these areas here for that. So we're not going to be too worried about um, this area here. When we bed, we're going to bed 6 inches into the barrel channel. And the reason for that is, if we don't, there's just too much room for flex from, from the um, action through to the tip of the forehead. So if you bed to here, it'll just come up and um, the, the wood will come up and hit the barrel as soon as you rest it over a backpack or sandbags. So it's just not really good. So we're going to go all the way down to roughly 6 inches bed back to here and then as you can see I've got a drain here so compound can leach out because I'm not interested in bedding these areas here I don't want to put too much bedding in there because I don't want to get the job trapped we come to the back here we're going to bed these flats here I'm not going to put compound all up the side walls here not up through here we're just bedding the flats so we're going to have a little bit come up just a little it'll probably come up two or three millimeters uh, what are we talking about? 80 to 120 thou, it'll come up. So that'll stop side play at the rear. But we're not going to try and get the compound all the way to the top. So we're going to have it mostly flat here. And then most of our bedding is going to be through this area here. <clears throat> when you're doing your fit up, 
you need to do plenty of trial fits. You can see I've hogged out this area here on an angle. Now here's a really important point. I've plugged the action screw hole. Normally you'd use the front action screw hole as a guide. But the way this uh, system works, we can't actually put a headless screw in here and put it down into the action because as you're coming down this way, the headless screw gets caught up on the sides here and you can't physically get the headless, headless screw in. Now we could put it together and put a headless screw in from the bottom, but what I've done instead is I've used my front dam here to gain alignment and um, I've made sure that everything lines up back here. I've still got slivers of reference points in the rear here. I've got slivers of reference points in the rear. So this is actually well lined up and then once I'm sure that I could see through here and that everything was lined up properly, after that I then taped it up, plugged it with plaster seam. So I know that she's going to line up properly when we're done. So that's another um, aspect of this bedding job that's going to be different to others. So whenever you come across something that's really new that you're not used to seeing, you've got to take this time and for some of you it's going to take two days to prep a job. The first day you'll start prepping it and you'll get to the end of the day and you'll be doing trial fits and then all of a sudden you'll find, oh, I think I'll, I'll knock off, I'll go away <clears throat> and if I come back tomorrow I might be able to do something differently and you'll come away, come back to it and you will, you'll find you'll start um, treating the job a bit differently, you'll, you'll start applying different uh, tricks and then gradually you'll work towards getting this ready, ready to go. So this particular job is just about ready to go now and we'll put the compound in it very shortly. Okay, so we're now pouring in our match grade bedding compound. Now you'll notice that um, there's a lot of voids to fill in this stock and you've got to be careful when using any epoxy resin to do a high volume fill that you don't um, create large air pockets from trapping air during your pour. So the key to this is just a nice, slow, even pour. So we'll take our time with this. It'll take a few minutes to fill this, and then we'll let it settle for a while. Okay, one last thing I want to go over, guys. When you're doing your plaster seam work, I know a lot of guys rush it, and, and they end up making a really untidy job of the plaster seam work. When you're doing your plaster seaming, please take your time to make it look nice. So if you're building a dam, trim the edges of the dam off to look nice. The tidier you are, the more time you take with your plaster seam, um, the better because you'll end up with a really nice looking job. So here we've done the pour. Um, as Steph just brought it a little bit up the side walls uh, while I was doing some other work here. We've taken a lot of time with the pour just to let it migrate slowly. So again, on the rear we're not going up the side walls but at the front as we move across here we will be going up the side walls with our bedding. And it's a big fill. Um, there's more than enough compound in one of our kits to do the fill, but uh, you need to really take your time so that you're not um, mechanically putting air into the job. Okay, so now we'll put it all together. Okay, so I'm going to pull this rear dam from here. There we go. Make sure she's alright. Starting to migrate now. I'm dropping that into there now. I'm going to pull my front dam. And let that come out. Down it goes. Here we go. And that's that job done. So just make sure we go down to the right height. Very good. And now we're set on the cleanup. Okay, guys, it's just getting on towards dark here, so I've only got a little bit of light left, even though we've got lighting in our workshop here. Um, I just wanted to go over the finishing of the job. As you can see, I've only got one bungee in place, and it's just a very light bungee. The way these go together, you don't really need to worry too much about bungee tension with them. So the other thing is there's so much wood, you've just got to be very, very careful about flexing it. Um, now if you have a look down here, I've put my top wood on one final time. Um, I've often gone about the importance of trial fitting. If you're doing a full wood rifle, and in this case, the number four Mark I is supposed to be free floated. So you can see I've got a wee bit of float on the top of the barrel, which means that I haven't got this sitting too high. 
So that's good. It looks like everything's come together fairly well. So over the next um, so many minutes, I'll be watching for this area through here to make sure that there's no suckbacks or anything like that. I can actually see a suckback forming on the other side. Just in this area, where are we? About here. It's starting to slump a bit because it's running off this top edge here. So I'll address that um, as the compound starts to cure a bit. And we're going to be using uh, these hot water bottles for post heat. And we've just got it in a, in a type of hot box. So that's basically the job. <coughs> Hope that helps. Okay, I'm just about to break the job out. And um, as you know, this is the key part here that we've got to worry about, the angle at which the stock comes out. So what I've done is I've put the... Um, the butt stock of the Lee Enfield in the vise and the uh, tip of the barrel is on a block and this way we can work this piece loose. So we've just got to do it step by step so I'm just going to use a block. I'll put some aluminium tape in the areas I want to hit. And this is how I've got to work at it. And it'll take some time. So you this is the area where most guys will panic and you've just got to be patient and willing to work through it. It'll take a bit of time, just step by step, breaking the job out. Alright, so I've got the job out and we're just having a quick, quick inspection of the job. Um, here's an extra tip for you guys. You can put your rifle in the freezer for about 20 minutes or more and cool it down and that will help you break open your jobs. However, if you want to do that, you must make sure that your epoxy resin is, is fully cured before doing so. Otherwise you'll make the, uh, the resin brittle. It doesn't matter which brand of resin you use, that's always going to be the case. Now just having a close look here, I see this, it's a bit messy through here. So I'll probably end up having to take a line here because I want this job to look really, really smart once I'm done. But otherwise, <clears throat> it's looking very good, and it should clean up and um, give us a, a nice finish. Okay, guys, that's pretty much the job done. I just want to go over a few things before we um, finish off, just to make sure that you're all clear as to uh, some of the traps. If you look closely here, I've had to grind out a divot. That's because when the action comes in, it, it comes in at this angle. So that divot helps the action come into place. So that's a, a very quick job. That's, that's no major. Um, once you finish, check that you're, um, if you're shooting a fully wood rifle, make sure that the barrel band um, can rotate freely once the barrel's in place. Check your float, of course. Make sure that the float is good to the end. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that this is just an overview of, of the bedding aspect. It's not a full accurising tutorial. Um, I just wanted to give you some ideas as to what could be done with the bedding. Um, another thing that we need to be careful of is this top wood. When I was um, sanding off this piece here, I was very mindful not to disc this wood off, otherwise that would alter the relationship between the top wood and the barrel. So. That's just one last thing to keep in mind. Cool. Okay, I hope you guys found that useful. Okay, during assembly, one more check we need to make is that the um, stock is actually held securely in place. Now, I've put um, my screw through here. As you can see, there's no front screw in here. And what I'm checking for is to make sure that the uh, bottom metal actually contacts the stock at the rear. If it doesn't, the only place the bedding will be held secure is at the front here, and the rear will be prone to flexing. If you find that this area here is has a bit of a gap between it, which you'll be able to see from un underneath here, then you'll need to either bed or shim that area just to make sure that that stock is pushed securely in place. So that's one other check we need to perform. Okay, there's a view of our of a four inch target I've cut out for shooting the 3 0.
Looks pretty small from back here, I can tell you. Well, let's see how we go. When I first received this 303 rifle, it was shooting uh, roughly two feet high and two feet off to the left. It was terrible. You'd never be able to take it into battle as it was. That was even with the sights drifted over as far as you could possibly go. She was a right mongrel of a thing. But uh, after the beating job, we've been able to do some um, excellent work here. So we'll go through our, our test results. So here's our target. Um, you can see where I walked in the Highland ammunition to sight the rifle in. And then I commenced test shooting with the Sierra Match King. Group size here is about 3 inches, so nothing fancy. And I also had a couple of flies, which I wasn't too happy with. After that, I changed to the 150 grain Hornady SST with Varget powder. And I got this group here. Very, very tight group for open sights. And then this group here, two shots in one hole and then one above it. And I also wanted to try the, um, the flip up sight uh, for the 600 yard aperture. And I got this group here, which is a little bit bigger. And I think the best group would be this group here, which was doing 2600 feet per second with uh, 44 grains of Vargat. And then we went to 44.5 grains of Vargat. And then to uh, 45 grains of Argot here and we started at 2600 feet per second and finished at 2700 feet per second. Cool! Well it's a wet night out in the bush tonight. Yeah, it's still drizzling away. Not as bad as earlier. Calvin's cooking dinner for us. Wild pork. The Vizzlers in bed. Yeah. Top bunk. Priority for little Vizzlers. Our bed area. Oh yeah. Worried he's going to miss out on the dinner. Oh yeah, some nice hot bread on the fire. Calvin's made a pork dish for us. Calvin's manly knife from Japan. What a knife! Cool. Oh, that looks so good. No, that looks really, really good. Can you tell me exactly how you cooked it from start to finish? So we shot the pig and then we singed the pig. Yep, singed them off with the blowtorch. And then you've boned it out. Uh, no, no, I haven't boned it out, and then I cooked it in um, water with onions, carrots, celery, and bay leaves. In a roasting dish with foil. Dish, yeah, yeah, four hours with um, just baking paper over the top and then tin foil to keep the heat in. About four hours, and then just pulled the bones out of it, and yeah. rolled it up, and boiled it. And boiled it. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, should be done. <laughs> yeah. You look hungry, Viz. You're really hungry. That is just fantastic. That's really gooey, too. Yeah, that gear bit is nicely cooked. At the end, once you've got your, the meat off the bone, you just stick it all in a bowl. Mm -hmm. And then all the juices that are left, um, you can kind of tell whether they're going to be any good because when you put them on your mouth, Mm -hmm. They're all sticky. Everything that they fall on is just horrible to clean. Mm -hmm. um, so then put it all in a bowl, squeeze it down, and then pour the juices on until it's up to the top as well. And then yep. put a plate on and a big rock or a brick or something and just leave it overnight to firm down. Mm -hmm. And that's what gives you your it's pretty much brawn with water. Nice. Pork, so yeah. Yeah, it's gone good. The old girl's looking pretty worse for wear. It's a hard day today. Man, did it rain. Oh well, the scene dry out by the fire. What a lovely morning in the valley. How did you sleep, Viz? He says I slept pretty well. Sorry about putting my feet in your crutch every five minutes. <laughs> Mm. 
Well, here we have a goat shot with the um, Lee Enfield and the 150 grain ECST. The range was about 200 yards, so the muzzle velocity, sorry, impact velocity would have been around 2200 feet per second at a guess. It was leaving the barrel at 26. I've hit quite high, but um, still, it's still within Kui. Shot. Yeah, he did travel a little way, didn't he? We'll have a good look through him and see where the where the bullet went and what happened. Okay, so the bullet's entered in the frontal chest, which I was using the line of the leg as my point of aim with the um, peep sights, and then it's exited sort of midway down the animal, which we'll be able to see in a minute, but you can a lot of broken ribs and so forth in there and you can see some of the damage there. One thing um, you've got to be careful of guys when you're doing your autopsies is if you cut it open with a knife as you're going through and you say oh this bullet's done X amount of damage you just be careful that it's not damage you've actually done yourselves when you're doing your, your own autopsy. And also I see people say oh the lung's jellified, like oh this lung's jellified. Well that's actually just bruising the, the central wound is here, but actually if I put my finger into there and start pushing through, what have we got? Let's have a look. So I've just pushed a piece of bone fragment out of the lung, so then you get some idea of um, secondary missiles and what can actually happen. So there's the central wound path, here's your secondary missiles, and this side here where people say, oh, it's jellified, not really, it's just bruising, and it can happen if you miss the vitals altogether. It can happen if you um, fall off something yourself. So yeah, we're starting to get a good idea of, of what's happened in here. You can see that this wound is quite long, um, but the, that particular bullet has a really low SD, and this is the sort of thing that can happen. It'll come in this way, and then it can glance off a wee bit that way, so... That's, that's pretty normal for um, that type of bullet. Yeah, no, very good. And the vitals over here, as you can see, well, it's done a huge amount of damage to the vitals because of it. So, very, very um, clean killing. It's a good bullet. A typical ECST performance, very, very similar to the uh, 308 150 grain. another day. Nice shot. Very nice shot. Oh, fantastic. Nice shoulder shot. So, oh, yeah, and you were 
aiming from up on that area up there. Cool. Oh yeah, up, straight up through there. It's a nice close shot. That was the 150 grain SST. Dropped it on the spot, huh? Yep. Yep. Did not. No worries. The old Lean Leanfield did its job. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how you had it for stalking. Yep. One click back, yeah. and you can't, you, you cannot physically pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And then when you're under fire, you can pull it back to the next stage. Yep, no cocking up. Rather than actually how we used to do it, which was... Oh, you have to pull that right back now, sorry. We used to... That chamber is empty. Yep. We used to um, walk with them like that. And, of course, the, the firing pin was always against the... Yep, against the back of the, it. Against the cartridge, yeah. So, you know, we all thought we were doing it the right way. Yeah, that's the safer way to do it. Sweet. Yeah, very good. That pig's got a real, um, a real European look about its head. That's real beautiful colours on it. Yeah. You can see where Calvin has um, shot the pig just here. Now, if you have a look at the line of the leg, the centre line, where you'd normally run your cross here, if you come to the front of the line of the leg, this area in here, in New Zealand, it's generally called the hiller zone. Um, I call it the autonomic plexus. If you strike in this area here, you end up with a very fast kill. Now, if the shot goes slightly forwards, you're still into your um, vitals of the neck area here. If your shot goes rearwards, um, you're still a centre lung. So if we have a look at the lungs here, the SST has hit, let's have a good look, the front of the lungs and done a large amount of damage through here. So, as, along with the lungs, it's taken the, um, the nerves out that, that run at the front of the chest and run towards the heart. And his exit wound, Calvin's exit wound, is just in the neck area here, so the animal was um, quartering away. Did you get a close look at that, please, Calvin? So, not a great exit wound, and it's not because the bullet didn't open up, it's quite the opposite. Um, the SST dumps its energy very quickly, and pigs are very, very tough animals, so it's done all of its damage. And if we look on the inside of the pig, we can't really see a lot, because if you come from this side, Calvin, because it's so far forwards, and then it's raked that way, we can't see a great deal of, of um, damage. But we'll get the legs off in a moment, and then we'll have a really good look. Okay. So I've just cut the leg open, and here's what I was saying about you can't sometimes judge by the size of the exit wound and um, how much damage the bullet has done. On this side here, we can see fragments of copper. Impact velocity for this shot was about um, 25-70 feet per second, and we've, we're seeing fragmentation, or partial fragmentation. If we have a look. There's pieces of bone, so this is a piece of the scapula. There's just, it's a huge mess. So, and quite often the way when you're at hunting, you, you lose one quarter. Losing two quarters is pretty bad luck. But losing one quarter is generally acceptable. So you, you cut this piece out and then you take your other three quarters. So if I flip the pig over, I can have a look through this area here. So I'm just going to make my cut in here. across here. If you have a close look here, Calvin, yep. you can see the massive amounts of damage. We've got a huge, huge wound channel. And so I can get three fingers in there, not quite comfortably, so I would say that's running, we're running between two and two and a half inches, because um, I'm three inches across here, so, and I'm just sort of fitting it here, right, so that's the size of the, the wound channel through there, and then we finish off with an exit wound of roughly a half inch, so there's so much elasticity in that, in that hide. So that bullet's done really well, it's formed well for us at medium ranges and at close ranges, it's a great bullet for the 3.0. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, there's our um, adventures with the 303 just about closed. Um, in the beginning, when I first um, accurised this rifle, 
we did the basic bedding work on it and, and tidied her up. Uh, the site here, the, it was just a simple 300-600 um, flip site. It didn't actually allow me to um, take a precise shot because um, on the target she was shooting quite low. So I've taken a micrometer sight off another rifle and fitted it. So this gives me a lot more adjustment range and it's, it's a smaller peep sight as well so it's, it's very good to use. Um, the parts, I've also done the trigger on this one and got that really, really crisp. Um, so the, the parts that are original to this rifle I've taken off and I've bagged and tagged them and put them away with grease. I, I don't want to actually muck around with this rifle, I wanted to make sure that the original parts were kept original. So I can always put those back on at a later date. So now that we've finished having our play with the rifle, this will go away and it'll um, be heavily greased and, and looked after. So we're not just going to use it and abuse it like the old 303s used to get because they're just not around anymore. We've really got to look after them. But one thing that I haven't really done and I need to actually go over is I've, I've polished the muzzle on this 30, but I actually haven't crowned it. And when I was shooting the Match King bullets, they were shooting at about three inches, and that's a boat tail bullet. The SST was shooting around 0 0.6, 0 0.75 of an inch. And I don't think <coughs> that's reflective of how much better that bullet is as far as accuracy goes. I think that this actually needs addressing. I think the muzzle's just not good enough. I need to actually get in and, and redo that. Okay. And with that small job done, I think we'd have a, a wider range of accuracy with different, different loads. So and the rusting last night, we were out in um, pouring rain and had to give it a tickle up last night as well. Yeah, so as soon as we got back I, I gave it a good clean down um, and all of that's covered in my next book which is due out very shortly. Um, the Practical Guide to uh, Rifle Accurising and Maintenance. So a lot of that's critical stuff, it's really important. I mean we were out looking for a pig last night, it rained on us. Um, by the time we got off the hill, got back to the bike, got back to the hut, mm. I was already seeing the lightest colour of orange just at the muzzle wear, which is quite well polished. And um, I wanted to get that gone straight away. So this, these rifles, even though we think, oh, it's a battle rifle, it can handle this, it can handle that. Yeah, they can handle and they can keep shooting, but whether they shoot accurately or not, that's another story. So we've really got to look after these older rifles. And as far as our... our Long range rifles go, we, we're expecting greater accuracy. Yep. We need to really put some emphasis into how we how we do things. And, and I really think that a lot of the cleaning skills have gone downhill. They've gotten worse. And some of that's to do with litigation for the types of oils that we use. Oh, really? And yes, what, what do you mean by litigation? Well, the oils that we're using are too thin. They're designed to... That in a worst case scenario, if the guy has it down the barrel and he doesn't bother cleaning his rifle and he goes hunting with it, pulls the trigger, it doesn't make any difference. That oil oh, just okay. can move out of the way and that bullet's going to be on its way. Yep. Trouble is an oil like that is so thin it just leaves the bore so quickly. Within um, a short period of storage your rifle's starting to rust. So even though you've oiled the bore, you put it away, that's done to rust. Wow. Yep. And, so, and this is a modern thing, you know, and we've, we've actually lost our way to some extent. Right. So we've got to get back to, to the, um, the basics of cleaning. So in this book, <coughs> we start, I've started with the how-to steps of rifle accurising. So we go through the bedding jobs, we go through all these preliminary phases and test phases as well. So we have a test procedure as to we take the rifle from the, from the um, shop, we go through a series of procedures um, towards accurising it. <coughs> and once we uh, achieve that final goal, then we move on to maintenance. Yep, looking after it in the field. And exactly. Yep. And the thing is, it's not just about, I mean, in the past, the book series has focused on long-range rifles. And um, every now and then I'll get an email from someone and will say, um, I know you're into long-range, but <laughs> can you help me with such and such a rifle? Well, it's, they're just rifles, the whole lot of them. Here we are hunting with this old girl today. So, you know, cool. They're all the same, so they've got to be looked after. Sweet. Yeah! Yeah. Yeah. 
Nice shot, Kelvin.